Good evening everybody, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to the Monday night live stream. I'm so happy to be back, I love these, I'm so pleased that we brought them back last week. I know many of you have messaged me over the course of this week to say that you enjoyed it, it feels like it's part of a weekend again, it's an extension to the weekend and with only a few days until the first race of this 2021 season, it really feels like things are coming together, doesn't it? We are back, Formula One is back and I love it. So it's been a really busy few days for me. Uh, I feel underprepared for tonight's show, but I hope you can hear me and see me. It looks like you can, which is a brilliant bonus. Uh, I've had the builders move in at home here today, so all hell suddenly breaking loose. And when half my life centers around recording podcasts and videos for which I need some quiet, today the builders have been smashing walls about, digging holes, pulling trees up out the garden, drink, bringing in machinery. It's been absolute chaos. And they're here for the next year. This project that we're doing at home here is pretty much going to see most of this year out. Or well, all of this year and into the beginning of next. So that's my life. Uh, but I'll be silly. I'll be broadcasting until they pull these walls down from around me. You might not be able to see me or hear me, but I'll still be, I'll still be going. Uh, and I hope you'll be joining me anyway as well. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to do this week. I've got plenty of questions that you guys have sent me. I've kept some of them. Uh, that I've saved from earlier on today when you've used hashtag Ask Elvis. I've got some of those lined up. I'm going to go through any ch any conversations or topics that you want to put in the chat. As ever, we'll dip in and out of that. Before I start, I must say a big hello to Mark Woodland, who can't be with us tonight, but will be watching tomorrow, and especially to his sons, Ben, Jensen and Ethan, who will all be watching with him on Tuesday morning. So thank you to all four of you. I don't mind when you watch. If you can't make it live, that's fine. I appreciate you watching whenever. So Ben, Jensen and Ethan, and of course, Dad Mark, thank you very much. Um, right, let's get into it then, shall we? Um, not, no, it's not a new tree house. <laughs> that's the one bit of the house they're kind of leaving alone, the tree house. Uh, much to my wife's dismay, because she wants to see it go. She doesn't like the look of it. What's wrong with her? Uh, no, they're pulling down all sorts of other bits of the house. We're building an extension on the back. Um, and yes, that's uh, that's the chaos that's about to ensue here. Right, let's talk Formula One, shall we? Let's start it off with a question that I've got saved. Uh, and then we'll get into your comments on that. And we'll get into some uh, questions that you pop into the chat as we go. Let's start with, uh, what should we go with here? Um, okay, this is a good one from Neil Roberts. In fact, he popped a poll on Twitter he used hashtag Ask Elvis, which is how I find it. Uh, and I'll put that same poll to you because his question was, who will be the next new World Drivers Championship in Formula One? So not the next champion, but the next new champion, someone who's not been champion before. His options were Leclerc, Verstappen, George Russell or somebody else. And I would love to know what you think. I took some time to think about this because it is quite a tough one, isn't it? And it relies on an awful lot of things coming into, you know, working out, figuring out to, 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 for the cards to fall a certain way. I actually went for Verstappen. I went for Verstappen because I think he's got a shot this year. It's entirely possible it could happen this year. But I also went for Verstappen because next year we've got this huge change. And you've always got to say that Mercedes are going to be favourites because they've had so much sustained success over such a long period of time. They've got the building blocks of success already in place at their organisation. They've got a brilliant culture, they've got brilliant people, brilliant technologies and resources and facilities and all the right elements you need to win a championship, they have. However, Max Verstappen and Red Bull have Adrian Newey. And if you think about Adrian's history and his successful years, a lot of those have come off the back of big regulation changes where he's been able to either find a loophole or adapt to a brand new set of regulations, a new challenge better than some other people. So on that basis, when we have a bit of a levelling of the playing field where everyone has a new set of opportunities, I think Red Bull and especially Max Verstappen could be in with a shout. But who knows? I'd love to know what you guys think. Uh, lots of you already saying Max. Uh, somebody saying Bottas. <laughs> I mean, look, I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> That's not fair, is it? Could well be Bottas. <laughs> It was out of order. Uh, lots of you saying Max Verstappen. Uh, George Russell. Uh, lots of you saying George Russell. Ocon, possibly. Not sure about Ocon. I've, I'm still jury's out with uh, with Ocon. What do you guys think on him? I mean, there is still talk. Of course, he's still part of the Mercedes family. 
Uh, there is still talk that he could be in with a shout of a Mercedes drive, but I just I can't see it at the moment. I can't see that he's done enough to to displace somebody like George Russell, who must be surely next in line. Um, lots of you saying, yeah, George Russell, Max could be champion this season, says Harry Cowan. He could well be. I do agree with you there. This is perhaps his best shot. Um, uh, Latifi. <laughs> um, uh, thoughts on Russell taking Grosjean's spot as one of the GPDA directors? Um, I don't know. Have I got any thoughts on that? I'm not sure I have any thoughts particularly on that. I mean, it's, it's good that he's stepping up. He feels like that kind of character to me that he, you know, he wants to be involved. He's a very mature head on, on those young shoulders, isn't he, George Russell? And I feel like, you know, if he does get the step up to Mercedes, he will be a great ambassador for our sport. I think he'll be a great champion if he, do, if he does indeed go on to be that. I think he's got all the right elements to his character that you need to have a brilliant ambassador for a brand and for a team and for the sport. And I just think he'll be a great champion one day. So yeah, George Russell, absolute star of the future. Um, Alan Stewart says, uh, have you watched Drive to Survive yet? Good point. I've started it, but I'm actually only two episodes in, mostly because I've just been so busy. Um, so I've done two episodes and I am desperate to get through the rest of it because I do love it. I think it's great. I know it's massively Hollywooded up. It's over dramatized. There's, there's, you know, when you, when, when you, when we know the truth, and many of you as Formula One fans, we know the truth. The Netflix drama is exactly that. It's dramatized. But don't forget, it's there to entice a new breed of fan into our sport, and and for that, it does a great job. And I also think we get some great little nuggets of information out of it. Some great little access to moments that you would never normally get access to over the course of a race weekend so i love it it's got great value um, and as long as you take the the dramatization with a pinch of salt uh, i think it's well worth watching so i'm looking forward to getting through the rest what do you guys think of that have you seen uh, who's watched it all yet has everyone watched the whole thing i'm sure many of you have lots of people had watched it seven hours after it was released or eight hours after it was released or whatever um right well where else should we go uh, Charles and Ferrari will come good. Um, I mean, Charles Leclerc and Ferrari, let's talk about them for a moment. I'm not sure that they have enough yet to be thinking about a world championship. Certainly not this year, I can't see it. But even beyond that, they are. They feel like a team that's still rebuilding. I mean, they had another complete overhaul of the management structure recently. And it feels like they've been doing that now for years. I still don't feel like they've got a solid foundation where they're all settled, everyone's kind of relaxed and happy and in the right place and they can start building. I think Charles Leclerc is a, a great driver with so much potential. I, I mean, I feel like he's in the wrong team, which is a, a terrible thing to say. But look, I was doing a podcast today and, and this is something we'll talk about very quickly. It's my podcast, Pit Lane Life Lessons. If you haven't yet listened to it, please go and search it up wherever you get your podcast from. I'm really enjoying doing it and lots of you are enjoying listening. But today I recorded an episode for the second series, which is when I'm going to start bringing in guests. And I recorded it with a brilliant guest. I won't tell you who it is yet. Um, it's a, a brilliant guest who, who really is a perfect fit for the podcast because he's somebody who really understands the mindset required to be successful. And part of the conversation was talking about how the mindset of a team like Mercedes compared to the mindset of a team like Ferrari. And this is someone who has had access to both of those organisations. And it's a stark difference between the two. And what you'll get when you listen to the podcast eventually when it's released is that it, even he feels that Ferrari don't yet have a culture like they had back in the Schumacher days, which was settled. It was constructed from all the right people, bringing them in from left, right and centre, building something from the ground up. Ferrari still feel like they're squabbling amongst themselves to sort of settle the, um, you know, to settle the quake that's been happening for a while. And, and until that they steady that ship, it feels like they can't start to build up forwards again. It's, it's um, I don't know, maybe I'm being too harsh on Ferrari, but I don't feel yet like they have, have got what it takes to start building a, a sustained championship challenge. But maybe you disagree. Um, let me see. Uh, I am... Re oh, D uh, Drive to Survive Season 3 is average, says Giorgio Rapetti. Um, 
That's interesting. Actually, I've not. You're not the first person to have said that. I've heard a few people say that it's maybe not as good as the first two. Um, I'll reserve judgment until I've seen it. But um, look, the first two I thought were great. So it is a hard act to follow. They had some quite tough restrictions, of course. Don't forget in 2020, and it wasn't. They weren't able to be as dynamic and zip up and down the paddock and follow the stories. They had to base themselves with a team for a set period of time and just capture what happened during that period. Because of the COVID restrictions, they couldn't be moving from one team to the next. They had to stay in a team's bubble. And then when they'd finished with that, they'd embed themselves in another team's bubble and work that way. So it has been done in a slightly different way. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, once I get through the rest of the episodes. Um, Andrew Storm says season, season three was fine. A nice review of last year. Um, OK, let's I'm dipping backwards and forwards all over the place here. That's slightly chaotic, isn't it? Let's pick up on the Ferrari stuff. Um, Ferrari was challenging for a championship in 2017 and 2018, not 100 years ago. Absolutely true, but they didn't win any, did they? And it has been a very long time since they won a championship. It was 2007 with with Kimi. And even that wasn't the most convincing of championship wins, was it? They haven't built sustained success. And if you can't build sustained success with a brilliant string of drivers, uh, a huge budget, perhaps the biggest budget that anyone's had over some of those years at least, you've got to start looking at what is wrong. Because Formula One is a sport where money can buy you success if you use it in the right way. Ferrari have never been short of money. And so what is the problem? What has been holding them back? Is it something about the organisational structure, the is it the people they've employed or is it the environment they've asked those people to operate within? Um, I don't know the exact ex the exact answer, but looking from the outside, that's my opinion, that they haven't got an environment that's conducive to getting the best out of people. Um, let me see. What else have we got here? Uh, lots of people saying they enjoy Drive to Survive. That's all great. Uh, let's move it on then. Um, let me see. If the midfield is truly closer than ever, do you think that Alonso, Vettel or Ricardo could put themselves into championship contention, says Jordan Chang. Um, I think the midfield will be closer than ever. I mean, look, let's just look at what, what's happening this year. 2021 is the final year of a relatively stable set of, stable set of regulations. I know we've got tweaks and changes to the aero side, which are significant, and that opens up opportunities, but in terms of power unit, in terms of the overall philosophy that Formula One has followed with the tyres and the aero platform, it's been relatively stable. And this is the final year before we do a complete change. Now, normally when you have the final year of a set of long-term regulations or more or less long-term regulations, that should be the closest year on record with that set of regulations because over time, people are looking for smaller and smaller improvements. People begin to converge with their technologies and with their understanding of those technologies and so this on paper should be the closest or certainly one of the closest years we've had. I think we may well get that at the front. I still think there's a bit of a gap to the teams behind the midfield if you call them that but I do think that midfield pack given the budget that they've had over recent years I think that's going to be closer together although they'll be in a separate group so can they challenge for a championship? I don't think so. I don't think they've yet got enough. I think this budget cap that sort of levels the playing field a little bit would have had to have come in some time before to get a close enough championship where the midfield contenders could be fighting for the overall world title. Um, but that's my opinion. I think the, the midfield is going to be a really interesting battle, maybe even more interesting than the guys at the front if... You know, if we get a Hamilton versus Verstappen or a, a Perez Bottas, if there's a mix at the front, that could be brilliant for the sport. And you only need two. You only need two drivers to be really going for it all the way through the season to create interest. But I think behind that, there could be a number of teams with Alpine, with McLaren, with Ferrari, with Aston Martin. Um, and who knows what else? You know, Alpha Tauri could be in there as well. It looks like Alfa Romeo have taken a, a leap forward with their car from pre-season testing. So I think the midfield could be really, really interesting this year and I can't wait to see how it all plays out. That's what I love about this time of year. We just don't know. And until we get to Bahrain, and really until we get to qualifying, Q3 in Bahrain is really where we get to find out, isn't it? Where, you know, we always used to say 
qualifying at the first race is where you finally have to turn up, you drop your trousers and show everyone what you got. There's no more hiding, there's no more fun in games. You just have to lay it on the line. And, uh, and that's the bit, that's the anticipation of that. I absolutely love every single season and it feels like we're in that now. Um, who's your pick for P3 in the Constructors' Championship? I think McLaren can stick with that. I think they can hold on to that. And I don't think, I'm not saying that lightly because I think it's going to be a really tough ask. It was so close last year. Don't forget, they finished third, but they could have easily finished fifth. Uh, you know, it swung on just a few points. Aston, uh, Alf, Aston Martin, as they are now, racing point, don't forget, lost those 15 points with that fine, that penalty from the pink Mercedes situation. And, and that, of course, cost them that position. So there's a, there's a number of teams that will be scrapping hard for P3. Um, but I think McLaren, the thing about McLaren is... They've got a great car. They've now got a really strong engine, which seems to be working well. They've still got two great drivers, one of them being new to the team, but great drivers. But more importantly than all of that, they've now built, when I talk about Ferrari not having a stable platform to build from, McLaren absolutely have that. I talk to the guys at McLaren on a semi-regular basis, and believe me, the mood from the people working in that organisation has changed dramatically. So people now are optimistic. People are positive about the future. And that hasn't always been the case. Don't forget, they've gone for a long period of time without any success for an, a huge number of people. In fact, probably the majority of people in that McLaren garage, they have never experienced winning a Grand Prix. Of course, some have, but that, that number's getting fewer and fewer each year. The vast majority have never experienced winning a race. And I can tell you from experience how important that feeling is because once you've had it you want it over and over again you know you've proven to yourself that you can do it and once you've proven it to yourself there's no more question mark about whether it's actually possible you know it's possible you just got to go and do it again and I think McLaren are in that situation now they're starting to have things to celebrate podiums p3 in the championship you sure you saw champagne being sprayed around the garage last year for the first time in a long time the mood is good and the future looks bright. So there's nothing stopping McLaren capitalising on, on their great finish to 2020 and going and do it all again. Um, let me see. Uh, good job by uh, Zach Brown. Yeah, Zach's done a good job. I think actually Zach Brown's... The best thing Zach Brown has done for me is he's done some great work in the marketing side, bringing in investments, which has stabilised the team. A really important job and that really if we think about Zach Brown that's his absolute biggest strength is on the marketing side is is securing financial investment to the team his biggest plus his biggest win for me was bringing in Andreas Seidel because I know a little about Andreas but talking to my friends and former colleagues at McLaren they all tell me that he has been an absolute breath of fresh air um, he's a, a forward thinker he's a visionary he's really embracing a change in culture and when you get a change in culture for the better that's when you start to think things can just go better and better and better that's the building blocks that I'm talking about that maybe Ferrari are missing and Andreas Seidel has definitely brought that to the team um, uh, McLaren made a good move hiring Danny Rick I agree with that too I think he'll be a great asset for the team um, and as, as I saw written somewhere else recently he also brings some outside experience into the team and that, that then gives them a benchmark because up until now for the last couple of years they've been doing everything with Lando and of course Carlos and their only experience in that period of time was McLaren. They could see what happened to McLaren year on year between the two but now they've got somebody coming in from the outside who Lando can start to measure himself against. Daniel can start bringing in some outside expertise of of his previous teams and he can start looking at McLaren with a fresh set of eyes, a fresh perspective. That's all really valuable stuff. Absolutely. Um, do you think Ron Dennis can be an effective team boss in today's F1? That's a great question. And also a question that I have pondered uh, in the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast uh, coming your way shortly. Can Ron Dennis be effective in today's F1? I think he could. And the reason that I say he could is that what Ron has done very well over his long tenure in the sport is be adaptable. 
He's a visionary himself. He was always ahead of the curve. And that means to do that, you have to be constantly changing and adapting yourself. He was very stuck in his ways in some aspects, and that will always hold you back as the world move for, moves forward. But in other ways, he absolutely was a character who saw an opportunity often before many others saw it. And therefore, he was able to take us as an organisation off in a different direction to capitalise on that. So I've no reason to think that Ron wouldn't be able to do that as the world moved. I think he'd be able to move with it, maybe even slightly ahead of it at times, too. So, yeah, I think he could do. Um, uh, Yuki has Honda checkbook. He got all the new stuff first. Uh, no idea about that. Um, what... Uh, hold on. Daniel is also polite and engaging, where Max is neither, sadly. Uh, I don't know about that. I think Max is very engaging, actually. Um, I think Daniel Ricardo absolutely, has got brilliant characteristic, and I think the team will benefit from that. The positive vibes that he brings when he walks into any room. You know, there's this saying, isn't there, that, you know, people. some people light up a room when they walk in. Some people light up a room when they walk out. Daniel Ricardo is one of those that lights the room up when he walks into it. And when you're leading a team of people, and he's a figurehead for that entire organisation, all of those hundreds of people will be lit up by the presence of Daniel Ricardo. That's got to be a good thing. Um, I don't think Max doesn't have that. I think Max is a very engaging character. Uh, he's a very different character. But look, none of us can take our eyes off Max Verstappen when he's in or out of the car. If he speaks, we want to listen most of the time because who knows what he's going to say. That's another very different type of characteristic. But he, I don't think anyone can say he's not engaging. Um, I see friction between Lando and Danny Rick, says Rohit Chetri. Now, that is an interesting point, right? I'm not sure. I, I, I don't see it yet. I'm not saying that there is any. Absolutely not. However, did anyone else pick up at the launch just a couple of, sort of slightly strange vibes between the two of them was it just me was I reading too much into it when Danny Rick made a couple of jokes at Lando's expense did he not react as well as we thought he should have done or he could have done uh, I might be over analyzing but but I'll be interested to see if anyone else picked up on that or whether it was literally just me I actually think they'll get on great over the course of the season the problem with any uh, driver pairing in Formula One is they can be as nice as they like they can be the best of buddies until it comes to the one guy getting in the way of you and your biggest prize, whether that's a world championship or even race wins. If the guy that's in your way is the guy on the other side of the garage, that friendship goes out the window and it's a very difficult thing to manage. And well, believe me, I can tell you that from experience. Um, OK, a couple of people saying, yeah, agree with the uh, Lando and Danny Rick stuff at the launch. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do think it was... Um, I don't know, maybe Lando was just trying to... I, what I got the impression was, was that Lando was just trying to set his stall out early, saying, listen, I'm not going to be a walkover. You will not be making jokes at my expense. I'm not this little young kid that he was being portrayed uh, as a little bit in that um, uh, in that, that film. So <laughs> I'm sure they'll sort it all out. I'm sure they already have. I'm sure it was nothing, but that was a little, uh, little nugget that I took from it. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it did seem a bit awkward, like a first date. <laughs> it did a little bit, yeah. Um, right, let's see what else have we got here. What's your thoughts on Merck's rear end issues, I Quantum HD? Um, Mercedes, they rear end issues at the test, so they definitely had an unstable rear end, didn't they? The thing about um, that Bahrain test, there's a couple of things you need to fully appreciate. It was a three day test only. That's nothing. I mean. I mean, in my day, we were testing for months before the first race. But even in recent times, it's been a two week test or a, a week test, week long test. Three days between two drivers is nothing. And yes, OK, you've got to just work to what you've got, but they will be working to what they've got. The test stopped after three days, but that doesn't mean they won't continue to work on that car, to understand that car and find <coughs> find solutions to the problems it's just that within three days that they didn't uncover that and of course don't forget you've got a whole host of other things to work through in a three-day test like aero correlation like signing off test mileage on certain components figuring out the new tires 
you know, these new aero changes to the car. So they haven't yet cracked the golden bullet on how to get the best out of that car. But it could be anything from a tweak to setup. I mean, go back 12 months, uh, Mercedes were struggling at the first test and they say, and I've got no reason to disbelieve them, they actually went through a sweep of ride heights at the last couple of days of the test uh, before last season. And it was only by doing that sweep, the ride height sweep, they they st stumbled across a solution, which was a totally different ride height setting at the rear of the car. And it transformed the way the car behaved. Now, I can tell you from experience that stuff happens. You know, it can be a small tweak on something that can completely catch you by surprise, either in a good or a bad way. It can be. I mean, I've known occasions when the engineer has issued a setup sheet you know, a group of mechanics have implemented that setup onto the car. The car's been transformed, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And when you go and set that car down, it turns out that maybe by accident, someone put a wrong setting on the car. Someone put the wrong ride height or the wrong camber or the wrong toe settings or the wrong spring or whatever it might be by accident. And in that moment, you stumble across the golden solution to getting your car to work. That happens. Uh, and so it can be as simple as that. It can be something like getting the tyres in the right window that they maybe didn't manage to do uh, on the day. Maybe it was the wind at Bahrain that was so strong and their car maybe is a bit more sensitive than others. So I don't believe for a second that Mercedes will continue to struggle like that for the season. They have a huge number of tools back at base that will allow them, although they're no longer running on a track, to continue running in the virtual world or with the car on the on the full scale rig, which they'll be doing all the time. Uh, and for those with those tools, you can learn a massive amount. And they may, may well have already uncovered the problem, found a solution, be working on developing that. And, and I'm sure by the time we get back to the race, things will be different. And if not on that first day, you know, they're experienced enough to be able to work through that problem and find the solution, just given a bit more track time. Um, is McLaren's diffuser a real game changer, John Chatterton? Um, I don't think it's a game changer. Uh, I, we talked about the McLaren diffuser last week, didn't we? Um, they've just come up with a slightly different interpretation of the rules. Uh, they've exploited a little bit of a loophole, which is a new addition to the regulations. And all it's done is allow them to get a little bit more of that diffuser material lower to the ground, which the regulations set to, this new for this year, set to restrict they've interpreted those regulations perfectly legally by the way but in a slightly different way to every other team at this point the reason i don't think it would be a game changer is it's actually a really easy thing for everyone else if it's as simple as everyone else not realizing that that was possible they can easily do that now and in fact if they wanted to between the test and the first race you could quite easily have a new floor produced by that point and on the car with that kind of detail on the back assuming it works for your aero setup on, on your car. There's no saying that just taking a, a component from one car, putting it onto another will absolutely work on yours. But I would say something like what McLaren have done to the, the diffuser is not something that's beyond the realms of possibility for others just to implement on their own devices too. So I don't think it's a game changer. It's a nice, clever interpretation of the rules. I'm surprised no one else has done it, but I wouldn't be surprised if before long everyone else has done it. Um, Let's see, have Williams improved this year, possible for points? Um, yeah, I'd say they've definitely improved this year by the sounds of it. And of course, look, it's difficult to judge anything from testing. I always say, and I maybe have said this to you guys before, the biggest thing you can take from pre-season testing in terms of understanding how people are doing is the body language of those people when they're interviewed, team members, drivers it's the reading between the lines of what they're saying rather than actually what they're saying uh, when they get interviewed and if you think about that and what George Russell has said it feels to me like they've taken a step forward will it be enough I'm not sure because it feels like Alfa Romeo have maybe taken a bigger step forward perhaps or certainly a significant step forward so we'll see I think it'd be nice if they've joined the pack they were on a on the right trajectory over the last couple of years, weren't they? So um, yeah, let's hope Williams can be back in the mix and start to show a little bit more every weekend rather than just making up the numbers, so to speak. Um, will the aero penalties be overcome after half of the season? Uh, that's a good point. 
In any normal season, so that's the aero penalties of the new restrictions around the floor, the diffuser and the rear brake ducts, I'm guessing you mean. In any normal season, I'd say absolutely. Uh, what, long before half a season's done, I'd say we'd be back up to pre-regulation change aero or downforce levels. Of course, this year, development's going to be massively restricted because of this massive push to get the 22 cars ready. Um, so I don't know. I don't know in terms of absolute numbers. I'm not sure how far off 2020 downforce levels we are at this point after the bit of development we've had. But I do think they'll continue to bring areas of development to barge boards, to edges of floors, to diffusers, around the brake ducts. All of those areas to try and maximise the change in regulations. And yeah, it may well be by halfway through the season. By that point, by the way, almost everybody, I'm sure, will have switched almost all of their resource over to the 22 cars. But we may well be back to pre-regulation change downforce levels. I wouldn't put it past them. Um, uh, how will Checo perform? Uh, that's another really interesting point that I'm really looking forward to, to finding out more about. Um, his body language and his comments post-test weren't quite as comfortable or as confident as Max Verstappen's were, unsurprisingly. He talked about needing a bit of time to, um, to get used to the, 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 the differences to this car, but he has got experience on his side, which the, the likes of, a, of, a, of an Alex Albon or a Pierre Gasly, when they got their opportunities didn't have so I think Checo could be strong you know I think he could be a, a proper good contender and from a Red Bull perspective of course that's exactly what they need so I think he'll do all right it might take him a little bit of time a couple of races but I think he'll do all right uh, what are your predictions for Aston Martin um, they have the basis or they should have the basis for a great car I think I mean they had a great car last year at times the pink Mercedes, if you want to call it that. Um, I think this year they have got extra resource to to um, to, to have factored into this, this new car. Uh, they've got an uprated uh, rear end off last year's Mercedes, which if they've managed to integrate that into their current car, which they say they have, should bring advantages. And of course, they've got the new updated Mercedes power unit, which if we can overcome some of the reliability issues that Mercedes suffered with at the course of, over the course of the test and of course Aston Martin I think they had some turbo troubles as well get that out of the way yeah I reckon they should be good I'm looking forward to it I think um well that's another big question mark isn't it Sebastian Vettel how will he do um when I all that stuff I said earlier about Ferrari and having this slightly chaotic culture it, it has to affect the drivers doesn't it it has to have affected Sebastian Vettel when he started to have poor results the pressure that he must have been under, not just from the outside world, but internally, I mean, he, he just wasn't happy, was it? His relationship with Ferrari deteriorated early. And so getting out of that environment into an environment that's much more friendly and welcoming, as he's described it, I think can be a real breath of fresh air for him. He won't have lost his talent. He just needs an environment or a culture to thrive in. This could be the one. So I think, yeah, I think it could be good. In a big fight for that big for that P3 position in the championship, perhaps. Um, will Checo challenge Max in the race? Um, I'll tell you one thing, you won't get Checo not challenging Max if he finds himself on the same bit of racetrack. Um, I would say there's almost no way that Checo will have gone there to happily be a number two. Uh, and that will be, a you know, if that ends up being a problem, it's a good problem, but it's a big problem if that Red Bull have to find a way to manage if indeed those two drivers getting each other's way if they are in the same bit of track if they're fighting for the same bits of road it's going to be a tough fight um and look we all know it can end in tears so uh, again another big unknown that's exciting to uh, to get to the, the bottom of uh sandy barnes any tales from the treehouse planned <laughs> um yes do you know the main reason i haven't done uh, any tales from the treehouse over the course of the winter it's because it's bloody freezing up there and it's windy as hell. So, yeah, now the weather's getting better. I will definitely uh, climb back up there and uh, and pluck out some more stories from the book. Absolutely. I've also struggled a little bit recently because I've been mega busy. We're heavily into filming uh, Wheeler Dealers now. 
that's taken up a huge part of every week and that's going to be ongoing now right through until I think May of next year so that schedule's crazy my podcast is also taking up a huge amount of my time way more time than I thought it would but I love doing it so much um, and, um, and it's clearly helping a lot of people which makes me feel very happy so I really want to give that everything that I can and I'm just now starting to figure out where I can fit in time to do other videos I'm obviously doing the live streams now back on a Monday so I am going to start gradually reintroducing more and more content as and when I can figure out the right scheduling to to make it happen so definitely coming your way you might just have to wait a little bit longer for it um, right what else have we got here um, uh, do you know, well, Ben Tripps asked a, a question around uh, Haas. He says, how has Haas got around the ban on the Russian flag being used if there's a ban by the world sporting body due to Russian doping scandal? Surely the FAA are not blind to this political statement. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that, um, as far as I know, WADA are still investigating. That's not a done deal yet. That's not something that has been cleared or otherwise i believe the investigation's ongoing so and we'll find out an answer to that at some point but yes it's slightly controversial isn't it um and what hang on one second one second what's up mate did she okay okay all right thank you um okay right i might have to go sorry guys <laughs> are you sure okay uh all right i'm sorry guys i am gonna have to go i'm really sorry to cut this short uh, but I believe Claire is um, is is suffering. She's got some. She's in pain in the other room with something. So I'm going to have to go. I'm really sorry to cut it short, guys. Uh, but look, family comes first. I will be back very soon. Thank you so much for all joining, and uh, and I will pick this up at some point. Keep the questions coming. I'll answer as many as I can over the course of the next couple of days. But I'm sorry to cut it short early. Thank you so much, and I will catch you all very very soon. See you later, guys. Ta-da. What's up, mate? It's all right.